It is great to have back on the program at such a critical moment in the Republican primary, Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, it, I know that there are so many things we didn't get to last time, and then so many things have happened since the since early August when you were last on. Maybe just to start, the campaign assess how your campaign is doing. If we look at polling when you were last on, it was seven ish. You're now between four and five. What's happening? Are you considering the campaign a success at this time? I think we're on track to achieve the goal. The goal is to be the Republican nominee and then to become the president and then more importantly, to revive our national identity and lead our nation forward. And I think that I'm on track to do it. And I know that that would not necessarily uh, be exactly what you see for the static polling today. It's not but obvious, I, think, I guess, is what it, you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I think I think that's a fair thing to say. <laughs> that would not be obvious from looking for, for any of the candidates other than Trump in this race. That would be far from obvious. I think the other candidates are, are playing a political strategy that involves being, you know, 11 percent instead of 8 percent. I've bounced around anywhere between four and 12 percent over the course of the last number of months. That's irrelevant. It doesn't mm. matter. I think that nobody is going to win this primary without the America first base that is going to determine the outcome of the Republican primary. I mean, that's what matters. And the tinkering around the edges of the rest of the, the you know, some combination of, of independent anti-Trump audiences that are you know, old school Republicans, classical Republicans that wished America first never happened, sloshing around the other candidates. That's a sideshow compared to who is the America first base going to choose as the leader to advance the interests of this country. And I think that's the future of the Republican Party. I think it's also the future of a base that goes beyond the Republican Party. I think that there's a lot of independents and even some stranded or orphaned Democrats who, you know, I think will be on board for the America first movement as well. But anyway, that's what I think actually matters, not the slashing around. So what do you think is going on? I mean, as, as far as your strategy goes, you know, Tim Scott has dropped out. Pence has dropped out. I was looking at your polling specifically in New Hampshire and some of these other states. And it's as, essentially we're talking single digits. Do you think you need to win even a single primary to justify staying in this thing? Or what's the strategy? Well, I, I think that in the early primaries, I need to beat expectations, be in the top three in Iowa, New Hampshire. I've said that since day one of this race and history would suggest that you know, there's many people who are able to place in the top three in one or both of those states that go on to win the primary. Hmm. Keep in mind, I came into this as somebody who most people didn't know who I was six months ago. And so for me to be in the top three in Iowa, New Hampshire puts me in exactly the trajectory we need to be to get to the ultimate goal. I will say, David, uh, you know, I may be the wrong person, uh, even relative to people who have been professional politicians to talk to about horse race analytics in a campaign. My approach is a little bit different. I'm sharing my convictions. I'm sure. sharing them openly. My job is to make sure that everybody in this country knows who we are. I say we because we're doing this as a family, but who we are and what we stand for. That's challenging enough. I think that there's a lot of barriers, the media included, that would create distortions for making that a difficult thing to do. But I want everybody in this country to know who we are and what we stand for, starting with the Republican primary voter base. If after knowing that fully, they want to go for somebody else, I'm totally at peace with that. But I'm focused on doing my job and we have a long way to go before people in this country do know who I am and what I stand for. And with that being said, that's where my focus is. And I'll leave the horse race analysis to others. But I my heart says we're going to be successful in this journey. That's why we're in this and we're going to continue to the very end. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening maybe in the party more broadly. You were critical at last week's debate of Ronna McDaniel and the role that she played in what was not a good night last Tuesday night for Republicans. You know, I'm open to the idea that maybe Ronna McDaniel has has some blame here, but isn't part of what's going on that Americans are, are really rejecting a lot of these policies, the anti-abortion stuff since the repeal of Roe v. Wade, every time a state has voted on abortion, they've said, no, we actually want to preserve this right. And yet you still have candidates in different parts of the country running against that. Is it possible, I guess, is what I'm asking that voters are just rejecting some of what's being offered by the candidates. Yeah, of course it's possible. <laughs> possible. David, I've, I enjoyed our last conversation because you're, you're so familiar to me. You remind me of a lot of my friends who I've grown up with. And so I'm going to take that me. as an insult. You, you know, you, maybe you could you could take it. It's elective how you choose to take it. Uh, yeah. But I mean it. I mean it, it you know, in almost an endearing way. Almost. Not All right. Though. Fair, fair. <laughs> but but what I would say is let's start with the critique of Ronna McDaniel. OK. 
I'm a guy who preaches meritocracy, 360 degrees. I like to practice what I preach. I, I'd like to think that that's the way I've lived my life and the organizations that I've built. And I talk about, for example, policies you and I may have discussed last time. I'm against affirmative action. I'm yep. against race or gender-based quotas. Why? Because I stand for meritocracy. I think the best person should get the job regardless of skin color or any other gender or other attribute. Best person for the job. How can I preach about the virtues of meritocracy in the rest of America, preach this message to the left, talk about accountability in government, if we're not applying those same principles in the party whose nomination I'm running for for U.S. president? Okay. So if you just look at the hard facts. I mean, this is somebody who, after she took over in 17, in 2018, and I don't think that that's, those values of Americans were that different in 2016 than they were in 2018, but in 2018, 2020, 2022, and 2023, consistently, I would say, blow disasters is what we've seen for Republican results relative to expectations in those elections. I think there needs to be some accountability. If that were a football team's coach, they would have been fired long ago. If the Republican Party wants to be a championship team, and I do, playing in that party, want to lead it to be one, then I do think there needs to be some basic measure of accountability, especially against the backdrop of this woman's salary has also tripled over that same course of time. So yes, on that debate stage, I called out, I think, what is the farce of accountability for Joe Biden. I think that Biden's not going to be the Democratic nominee. I called on him to step aside. We'll get to that. A lot yeah. of hypocrisies from the media. But my point here is the way I view it is accountability starts at home. And so I can't be pointing the direction at others without looking in the mirror as a Republican Party for basic accountability to say, is this the best person for that job? There's not a shred of evidence to support it. And I think that there's a lot of evidence to support that an average person off the street could randomly be placed at random in the role of running the Republican Party and the Republican National Committee. Yeah, but that's not really job. an answer to, you know, 61 percent want abortion legal in all or, mo or most cases. And the fact that so many Republicans are still running against that, it seems logical that that's hurting candidates. I mean, it's not like a trick question yeah, or a so gotcha. I think that, you know, it's not a gotcha. I mean, you asked me about where my criticism of Ronna McDaniel comes from. Yeah. He's not the best person for the job. It's sure, that sure. Simple. And I, I agree with that. Yeah. You and now I are on the same issues. page. Now let's go to issues, you know, yeah. with respect to substance here. I think some of this, I think human beings are not animals. What does that mean? Or <laughs> not are not ordinary animals. Ordinary animals are not subject to persuasion. OK, they're not mm. subject to reasoned debate that caused them to change their mind or believe in something bigger than themselves. I don't see human beings as just a bunch of beans to be counted and then feeding people what they want to hear and tallying up the tally. I don't believe in that. I believe in open debate, persuasion and discussion. I'll give you one example on the issue of abortion. Yeah. I've traveled this country. I've been to states red and blue and, and everywhere in between. It take the actual case that Clarence Thomas brought up of a pregnant woman who's walking down the street. She's assaulted. The unborn child dies as a result. I haven't found one person, let me know if you find one, David, who says that that criminal does not deserve liability for that death. Mm. I think everybody, wherever they are in the abortion debate, agrees on that. Well, what does that say? Most Americans share pro-life instincts in common. The idea that that was a life that was lost that somebody who injured that pregnant woman deserves accountability for. So all I'm saying is this is a complex issue and it deserves yeah. and merits, I think, open debate. And I don't think Republicans have been making the case nearly as persuasively as they should. I'm talking to you from the state of Ohio, where I was born and raised and where I live today. I think it is a shame that there was no alternative proposal to the one that was on the ballot. And you're right. The one that was on the ballot did pass. It basically right. allows abortion now up to the time of birth without parental consent. That's what people of Ohio, which is a red state, voted for. So we have to grapple with that. But I think part of the failure is there was no affirmative alternative. Okay. And that's not just on the abortion issue. I think it goes for a lot of different issues. One of my goals in this Republican primary and in this hopefully general election when I get there is to offer an alternative vision, not just criticizing what the left puts on offer. I think sure. a lot of Republicans can do that. Race, gender, sexuality, climate, whatever that vision is. I have a separate vision grounded in what I would call conservative principles, individual, family, nation, God. Yes, these are actual affirmative values that we can stand for that are inherently, I believe, good, that can help reunite and revive the fabric of this country. And I do see that as missing. As we, we, it's easy to criticize the other thing. It's harder to build up a vision of our own. And I think that's part of what's been missing. And I'm not going to be afraid of 
Just as I'm not afraid of criticizing Democrats, I'm not going to be afraid of criticizing Republicans for our failures as well. So interpreting the Vivek speak, I think you're saying, yes, there is something there to, to what I'm saying. And uh, uh, you're you're uh, recognizing that. And I think that that's that's important. You, I want to talk a little bit about your relationship, not literally your relationship, but but ideologically to what is taking place in the primary with regard to criticism or lack thereof of the presumptive front runner Donald Trump. Uh, increasingly, we are starting to see Republicans bring up the Trump cognitive issue. Now, there's been a lot of discussion of the Biden cognitive issue. You and I yeah. even have spoken about that. Ron DeSantis is now going after Trump's cognitive health. Uh, Nikki Haley has started to talk about his confusion. Other Republicans who aren't running are talking about it. And to be clear, I'm talking about regularly saying that Barack Obama's president, that he beat Obama in 2016, et cetera, uh, you know, not knowing that Rudy Giuliani's right in front of him, not knowing that Melania Trump is right next to him, talking about the wrong city that he's not actually in, saying Biden's going to get us into World War II, saying that uh, Hungary shares a border with Russia. I could go on. Um, do you think that that is worthy of discussion? What's your reaction to your fellow Republicans starting to bring that up? Is it substantive or is it an act of desperation? In this narrow case, I think it's an act of desperation. And I think they're barking up the wrong tree and it doesn't make sense just because, you know, I mean, I, I interact with a lot of the candidates, you know, backstage at events, yeah. et cetera. I would say that, you know, Trump is, say what you will about him, he's with it. He's sharp. Okay. Now, hmm. does everybody misspeak and speak with precision at different stages of their lives, verbal flubs? Sure. And I could point out countless instances of each of those other candidates doing it too. Okay. But I think the question is when you go for substance, you can disagree with a lot of his policies. I think that's what's actually at issue for much of the rest of the Republican Party is there's a divide between the George Bush, Dick Cheney, old wing of the Republican Party that wants to retake that over. And that's right. an ideological divide. And I think there's really something there. Hmm. I'm running with a different value proposition than Trump is that I have fresh legs. I'm from a different generation who can reach the next generation. So I think these are legitimate issues to talk about. But the idea of saying that this guy somehow is, is out of his wits yeah, I just don't think is is that persuasive because it's not true. I think that he is absolutely. I mean, you know, even even some of the brief conversations I've had with him, I mean, going into details of the deals that they were doing with, you know, different NATO countries to step up to stand up for what they were actually supposed to actually put up. Even some of his speeches recently laying out, I thought some interesting details about Iran and the discussions that we had about even after he killed Soleimani, the subtle negotiations of Iran pretending like they were going to knock down actually U.S. military bases with precise missiles that happened to blow up beforehand and the way that was gestured. I mean, those are nuanced subjects that you don't hear a lot of professional politicians talking about. And so I don't think that going after Trump, you know, on the fact that he's cognitively unable to do the job, I don't think is the right tree to be barking up. Yeah. And, and I would say the other thing that irritates me about a lot of these other candidates trying to, you know, now people who have been licking Donald Trump's boot for years. I mean, Nikki Haley's in that category. Ron DeSantis is in that category. I mean, these people have been licking his feet, begging for money and endorsements. I mean, Ron DeSantis' old ad groveling, reading a childhood book to his kid about Donald Trump and Nikki Haley effectively prostrating herself like Ron DeSantis has and a bunch of other politicians have now, yeah. Monday morning quarterbacking one small thing he did. I'm in the other category. I have not been licking Trump's boot for years. Absolutely not. I have no reason to. I've been building businesses and doing things in the world. But I think that the right thing to do is to honor the America First movement. That's what's going to actually determine the future of the Republican Party. I think that's a good thing. I share those values in common. And make the case for yourself. Why are you the best suited person to actually do this job to one of the other candidates? And I think the other Republican candidates are failing to make their own case, resorting to cheap attacks in, re in reverse. So and let's way, get would, to that. I, I would just say one more point, David, on that, yeah. just for consistency purposes. I think I, I say the same thing with respect to making the case against Biden. I think I it was, was going to say to that. In this, yeah. yeah. In the same way that you say in your private conversations with Trump, he seems with it. Democrats say the same about Biden. So would you say the cognition is off the table as an issue for both? I haven't met Biden. Uh, right. So I can't going by the Democrats who have that. Yeah. But you don't, I mean, that's not something that you hear me making as the prime case against Biden either. I gotcha. I, my, my deeper case is, I, and this applies to both parties, but it certainly applies to the administration right now. It's that the people who we elect to run the government, they're not even the ones actually exercising power. Yeah. It's an administrative state. 
in three letter agencies that were never politically accountable in the first place. Right. And, that goes and we did talk about that last definitely time. a Democratic issue. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Um, speaking of, you know, your your criticisms of Trump have been very on the edges, called him the best president of the 21st century and America first is great. Trump has said positive things about you. Can you on this program say definitively, is there any sort of agreement that you made with Trump that you would get in there to kind of divide Zero. up the non Trump vote and whatever, and that Trump won't attack you, you won't really attack him. And ultimately, you'll you'll get name recognition. Maybe he'll consider you for VP, but you're really clearing a path for him. Anything implicit or explicit like that? Definitively, no. I just give you a hard answer on that. That's easy, right? And and. It's, it's that simple. I know that people, you know, like to you know make up excuses when they're failing. And so I think some of this has been opposition research from other candidates or otherwise mm. dead false. Now, I think it's accurate that Trump and I have a relationship of mutual respect dating from when I wrote my first book. We ended up, I mean, I met a lot of people across the country. Actually, Ron DeSantis in that context, Nikki Haley reached out to me, actually, when uh, when the buzz was building around that first book, she established contact rather than the other way around. Donald Trump did as well. I ended up having dinner with him. Probably had the most chemistry of any of those people that I met, probably with Trump. I think really? we both have business backgrounds. Yeah, I, we, we, I was impressed when I met him uh, in New Jersey because you get the impression that he's going to be some sort of high level, not in the details guy. Right. I was actually pretty impressed with a lot of the details, even mostly as it related to foreign policy and otherwise that we got into. And so, you know, I think some of the other politicians I met came across as far more flat. I mean, the Nikki Haley call to me was was hilarious. She reached out. She was clearly building allies for who she wanted to, you know, plot and her, you know, allies that she wanted to build to the presidency, thinking that I could be one of those. It was very plastic. Um, but anyway, putting putting that to one side, I it's think a no. I had a natural affinity, you know, I would say a, a mutual respect for one another. I don't agree with them on everything, but we're probably 90% aligned on America first policies. And so, yeah, I'm an America first conservative as well. I personally think that I'm able to reach the next generation in a way that none of these candidates can. I think that's going to be important. I think young people value candor. And even if you don't agree with everything that I say, my view is you don't have to agree with everything I say in order to still believe that there's a leader who can take our country to the next level if we're frank and honest about it. But that being said, yeah, I think that Donald Trump and I probably have more of an affinity for each other than most of the other candidates in this race. But the idea that there's some sort of implicit or explicit agreement is ridiculous and there is none. Couple quick things, hopefully, in the last few minutes we have. You mentioned at the end of the debate last week that you don't think Joe Biden ultimately will be the nominee. And you mentioned Michelle Obama as someone that may be put up there by Democrats. She has said definitively she is not going to run for president. Not like maybe not. I haven't thought about yeah. it. Just I'm not running for president. Do you not believe that? Do you know anything we don't? No, I mean, I, I believe that she doesn't want to run for president. I think that much is clear. I'm not sure that it's her choice and I'm not sure that it's Biden's choice. I mean, really, hmm. I think that there's a managerial machine who's that in decides that. who's going to be churned out. It's not one person. It's a system. And I think it goes back to the way the government's run. I think the people who we elect to run the government are not the ones running the government. I don't think Joe Biden is really making most of the policy decisions that come out of the executive branch of the government. I really but don't. give an think, example of someone who's making the decisions. I know you can't, it's not one person, but there must be it's a group. Not one person. It, well, I'm, I'm resisting the premise, David. It is a machine. That is the Leviathan. I mean, who, may, who, the, who runs the this machine? This is the apparatus. It's, it's the wrong frame. That's the whole point. David, who built it? the machine? Well, I think it's been built over the years from decades of loss of purposeful loss of accountability. I think it was built by people who were elected into office that did not want to actually bear the accountability for their actions. And so quietly devolved power, first from Congress to three letter agencies, from three letter agencies to a managerial class that pervades the public and private sector alike. You don't have to take it from, uh, you know, what, 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 you, what you will see as a you know, crazy Republican candidate, uh, you know, far right or whatever you want to label me on your show. Michael Lynn has written about this in a lucid manner. I think that there's a horizontal managerial class that pervades the public, private and, and intermediate sectors in the United States that's wielding the decisions. I just think it would put a lot of texture to it if you were able to say, you know, Hillary's Susan in the Rice. class you know, or you know, Susan, Susan Rice. Yeah, you know, I mean, you, you, you can give you, you can give examples of the Nancy who Pelosi's been. husband or Ellen DeGeneres or, yeah, but, you know, but, 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 but that's not that's neither. That's not my view. And I understand the way the game is played to them. It's not a game. Get, I'm get just me, curious. It is who a game, it is. David, it's fine. I understand it. I'm having fun with it. No, is but that, what's is, uh, it's no, not but a David, game. I understand it's, it. There you're, must you're, be you're some sort of, people. 
David, and I don't say this in an in an, in a um, in an ill spirited way at all. Just getting to the truth of it, you are like dripping with the viscosity of sanctimony as you ask this question. No, that's a, that's an ad hominem debate. Picture. That's unfair. I think hominem. you don't Let's want to answer the question. Saying, that's no, to I'm, attack I'm me. The, it's an obvious question. If there's a machine and a managerial a class, someone it's must be involved. Some there no, must David, be some. That, that's your that that's your assertion, David. And, and I think that my whole premise is that. I think this is true in both parties, but it's particularly true in the modern Democratic Party. I don't think Joe Biden has a choice in the matter of whether he's the nominee or not. You I can keep repeating that and you can do ad hominems, but you're Democratic not really party. answering. I'm not, David, and, and for you to for you to sort of uh, now claim victim and claim ad hominem. I'm no, I'm not a victim. A I'm fine. I'm a big boy. Playing, I'm a big boy. Actually. I'm big, a big well, boy. Of course you are. And so I'm treating you like one. And, yeah. and so I think the viscosity of the questioning is basically resisting the premise of the core point that I'm sharing with you, which is that it is not one puppet master that's an individual. I agree. It is a managerial machine that in the Democratic Party, in the Democratic establishment, and I think it exists in the Republican establishment too, is designed to crush the will of everyday citizens and to decide that this is who will be served up to you to digest. You're force fed who you get. I think this is why they're you know, the Biden documents case. Why don't you hear much about that right now? Why don't you, the, the open-ended investigation of Hunter Biden. I think these are levers that if Joe Biden tries to act like an agent and say when their time of deciding that he's not the nominee, well, I think that's when you're going to see those investigations then pick up steam to say that, well, you're not getting out of the way. We're right. going to get you out of the way. I, I think that that is the whole, that is the Leviathan. It is yeah. not an individual. It's not individual action. It is collective. But I'm not action. claiming it's That's an individual. I mean, listen, I think ultimately the audience can evaluate when I say give me anyone and you say my questions say, are the, the, when you say my questions are people, viscous. One, one of hundreds of people, the Susan Rice's of the world, sure. Fit okay. in that machine, but it's not one puppet master. People like Susan Rice. Yes. People like exactly. Susan Rice. People of that All class. Right. Absolutely. That's an answer. That could have been the first thing. You know, I mean, I, I don't know why my but, questions but I, are but, viscous. But I don't, but I've, but I've played this game enough to know to say that, oh, well, Vivek thinks Susan Rice is the puppet master. But no, I'm not, not saying one that. Person, I have no interest in saying that you said that. I just wanted to feel, I just was like, what sorts of people are you well, thinking about? there you got about? an answer. There you go. Whatever yeah. games others might play, I'm certainly not playing with you. I'm just curious who you're referring to and people can judge it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think people have an innate understanding that the people who are the politicians pretending to make those decisions, yeah. they're not really the ones making those decisions today. And I think the more clearly we see that, the more clearly we understand the work we have cut out ahead of us to reform a broken system. I'll give you other examples, too, while we're at it. See, now that, now, now that you sort of clarified where you are on which premise you're asking about, I think the donor class is part of this as well. I think there's a lot of people who, in the Democratic Party, you're told that the Democratic Party stands for one person, one vote. Right. Well, I don't think so. Not so clearly. I think that the people who are writing multi-million dollar checks, even though they say you can only give $3,300 to Joe Biden, right. why is he flying to Greenwich, Connecticut for twenty-five dollars or $50,000 of plate dinners? I and this applies to Harlan Crow and the Koch brothers too, right? I think it pervades both parties. Okay, I, just making I, I, sure. I've been as critical about this in the Republic, but you're asking me, you're asking me, you asked a question about the Democratic Party. Yeah. I'm against the influence of mega money in politics, period. But I'm with this you. is when you get to the reality of what that machine looks like, these are inputs into that machine. People who have lived in high levels, but not politically accountable levels of the administrative state that still have you know, the dirty secrets that they're able to use as levers for the people who actually are in power to the mega donor class that provides the mother's milk that is modern politics in both parties. Yes, I think that is all part of the machine that decides who and who isn't part of eligible to wield power. All right, Vivek Ramaswamy, I think this is the first time ever that the word viscous has been used as an adjective to describe me. And uh, for that, we, we will certainly make a note in the show archives. Uh, listen, Vivek, it might stick if, 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 if it might stick that. for lack of a better term. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we're, we're watching this campaign very closely and we're going to see what happens when the voting starts. And I appreciate you making time for me again in your busy schedule. You're a smart guy and I enjoy having conversation. We didn't get to a lot of policy discussions, no. so, so we'll have to continue that. I'm going to mention if there is a next time the test for 18 to 24 year olds to vote has to be where we start, but not today because I'm being respectful of your time. We'll Graduate start with from that. high school, pass the civics test that an immigrant has to pass. That's the punchline on that one. But we can. All right. I would time. say apply Thank it you. to all ages if you want to do yeah, that. Let's, start, but let's just let's just start with let's just start with the clean slate. So you're not taking a reliance interest away from somebody else. But in right. principle, I'm all in for that. 
but very conveniently with, with the most left-leaning voting bloc. I, but I let's do, not open do the door. Everybody. Let's not open the door. I would do I for everybody, but let's start somewhere. We will discuss next time. Vivek yeah. Ramaswamy, thank you. Thank you, man.